Five-year-old Knut Rockne and his Norwegian family immigrated to Chicago in 1893. The young Knut proved to be an adept athlete and an excellent student, but college would have to wait. Instead, Rockne went to work at the Chicago Post Office for four years. He saved enough money to pay for college and chose Notre Dame. He was a diminutive guy. I mean, he weighed like 147 pounds play, playing right in. You had little men, but they were all fast. Rockne was a half mile and a pole vault in track. And he was known more originally for his track than he was for football. Rockney played and later coached for Harper's father, Jess. When Coach Harper stepped aside in 1917, he handed the reins to his star pupil. Rockney, as an assistant coach, was very popular with the students and such, and other schools knew about him. And he applied for various jobs. In fact, if Harper had not gone back to Kansas when he did, Rockney would have probably become the coach of uh, what is now Michigan State. There were famous coaches before Rockney, but Rockney was the first celebrity coach. Um, and Rockney really worked at it. I mean, he really worked the press. Uh, you know, he did favors for sports writers. You know, he cultivated the press in all kinds of ways. And he, and he was a, a, apparently a, a, a truly charismatic man. I mean, people were just drawn to him. I don't want anybody here to come out for spring football who don't want to. As a matter of fact, I don't want spring football unless you do. Now, uh, all those in favor of coming out for spring football, those who insist on having football, insist on having Hunk and Shav and Vadish and I uh, take charge of this spring, will all signify by saying aye. He was a stutter. And he couldn't give a speech first year he was a coach. But he worked on it, and he developed this rapid delivery of speech to overcome the stuttering concept. But don't forget, man, we're going to get him on the run, we're going to go, 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 and we aren't going to stop until we go over that goal line. Don't forget, man, today is the day we're going to win. He worked for the Studebaker Company, and he was making 10000 a year as coach and athletic director at Notre Dame, and they paid him more for one year of going around, I think, to 24 regional uh, sales meetings. And he would talk nothing but football, never mention a car sale. And immediately after he left, those sales just climbed dramatically. The thing that could help them most, the thing that could inspire them and refresh them, would be to go out to see a high school or a college team play basketball and play football, because there, they do not justify defeat. Those lads do not feel sorry for themselves, but they stick in there and give the best out of themselves until the last was a blow. I would say that Rockney was probably the best salesman in this country has seen. He sold himself and the university to the very best football players he could find. As a result, Rockney won 105 games and three national championships in 13 seasons. He rode the mythic four horsemen to his first title in 1924. The watershed game was a 13-7 victory over powerful army at the polo grounds. 1928 was a trying year for Rockney. His team had lost two games and the injury-riddled Irish were outmanned as they prepared to face unbeaten army at Yankee Stadium. Notre Dame would need every advantage it could find. So Rockney summoned up the name of his greatest star, George Gipp, who had died eight years earlier. Rockney mentions Gipp and he doesn't do the famous speech because that had not been written yet. Uh, that was written two years later by his ghostwriter. But he talks about Gip, and he talks about uh, how well he had done against the Army, and how about winning this game. The speech apparently worked. Notre Dame won, 12 to 6. The following year, Rockney and his team became nomads, as construction commenced on a new football stadium at Notre Dame. He scheduled road games in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And this created the Subway alumni. These are the millions of Notre Dame fans around the country who never attended the school, but have very passionate feelings about the football team. And during the 1920s, a lot of those Subway alumni were poor, they were Irish, they were Catholic. And while they struggled with prejudice and trying to join the country's middle class, 
they took tremendous pride in Notre Dame's success on the football field. That success reached a crescendo in 1929 and 1930. Rockne's teams didn't lose a single game and won back-to-back -back national titles. The 1930 season featured a one-point triumph against Army in front of 110,000 fans at Chicago's Soldier Field. The Irish followed up with a 27 to nothing shutout of USC in Los Angeles in the season finale. When the team returned to South Bend, it was greeted by thousands of fans who turned out to pay homage to their conquering heroes. Rockne was just 43 years old and had already become an icon. His popularity and celebrity had rivaled the status typically reserved for presidents and movie stars. In fact, Hollywood was calling and asking Rockne to film a football demonstration movie. On March 31st, 1931, he boarded transcontinental Western Flight 599 in Kansas City, bound for Los Angeles. Shortly after the takeoff, the plane flew into a vicious spring storm and crashed in a wheat field near Bazaar, Kansas. There were no survivors. I can remember vividly when the guy coming down the street yelling, extra, extra, New Rockney killed. Uh, Everybody heard that, and everybody was sorry, because he was a great figure here. Even now, decades and scores later, Newt Rockney remains the greatest coach in the history of college football. He won national titles, and he made people who had no interest in college football care about college football. There are just certain people come along in your lifetime, not very many of them, doesn't take long to call roll with this class, that are people like Newt Rock, they're just great natural leaders and winners. What he brought to the ethos of Notre Dame football in, in that very pivotal time in, in American history, not just in football history or college football history. Uh, the whole idea that, that you could come off the floor and survive and then win and do very well meant not just a lot to, to, uh, to Nuke Rockney and Notre Dame, but to all America. And I think the idea that here comes Notre Dame meant a lot to the country.